All right, it's 631. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Anna Withers, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. I am the Farmer and Resource Development Manager for Springfield Community Gardens. And if you don't know us yet, we're a nonprofit located in Springfield, Missouri, whose vision is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. And this workshop on seedling and transplant production is generously supported by the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program from the USDA and Missouri Department of Agriculture. Our speaker tonight back with us is MU Extension Horticulture Field Specialist Patrick Byers, and I'll let him introduce himself further in just a moment, but just some housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions throughout the night, please feel free to ask as we go. You can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type your question during the presentation, and Patrick will stop periodically to chat and answer your questions. There's also a chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use that for comments and it helps me keep track of the questions, make sure we get all of those answered throughout the night. Also, once you leave the workshop, a screen will pop up with a link to a post workshop survey. And that survey is really important to Springfield Community Gardens. We use it for our reporting to the USDA and it also helps us provide meaningful workshops for you in the future. So we'd really appreciate it if you could just take a few minutes to fill that out after the workshop. Also, if you would like to refer to this workshop later, it will be available on Springfield Community Gardens Agriculture Workshop Playlist on our YouTube channel. And I will be sure to put that link as well as our website, social media, and tonight's exit survey in the chat in just a moment. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'll pass it off to Patrick. Very good, thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure to be with you here this evening. As Anna mentioned, my name is Patrick Byers and I am a horticulture field specialist for the University of Missouri Extension. I'm based in Webster County in Southwest Missouri. And I'm so excited to be partnering with Springfield Community Gardens and the USDA to offer this series of workshops. And tonight we'll be talking about seedling production. And uh, we've got some uh, presentation material for you and several videos to watch uh, during the, the program this evening. And I've worked for a University of Missouri Extension for 14 years now. And prior to that, worked with, with farmers in, in other capacities. It's been my pleasure to serve farmers for over 33 years now. And what I'll be sharing with you tonight is sort of the, uh, the uh, collective wisdom of hundreds of farmers. And uh, hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy the presentation. Uh, as Anna mentioned, we'll have ample time for questions. Uh, please enter questions into the Q&A box as we go through the material. I'll stop periodically and we'll tackle them. And at the end of the workshop, we'll have a chance to, to uh, have another Q&A session where, where we'll be able to, to unmute our, uh, well, we won't be able to unmute our mics, but we can certainly uh, spend some time together virtually and uh, tackle any questions that might come in. Okay, I think at this point, let's go ahead and start the presentation. Okay, Anna, can we see the uh, presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, uh, the subject tonight is transplant production. And uh, we're gonna spend, again, roughly the next oh, 60 to 70 minutes talking about transplants and seedlings. And uh, it's a fascinating topic. And quite frankly, this is the sort of material that could easily fill several days of, of time together. And we'll, we'll hit some of the high points. I've sort of targeted this presentation for beginning farmers. But if we have experienced farmers with us, I'm sure there'll be some useful information in, in, uh, in here for you as well. And also uh, good information for home gardeners too, because many home gardeners are increasingly turning to starting their own transplants to, uh, to plant out into their gardens. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a horticulture field specialist. I'm also a farmer. I have a farm uh, east of Springfield. Previously, I grew peaches. Now I'm establishing a new farm that will focus on uh, um, elderberries and forest farming. So I'm looking forward to, to the future and, and uh, learn, learning more about uh, some new ways of farming. Springfield Community Gardens, one of the partners this evening is a nonprofit organization based in Springfield Green County. Uh, the vision of Springfield Community Gardens is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. And uh, the uh, Community Gardens group oversees 18 community gardens spread across the uh, Springfield Green County area. And uh, Springfield Community Gardens also has a very innovative farmer incubator program. And if you're interested in becoming a farmer, uh, reach out to Springfield Community Gardens. Lots of excellent resources there for, for farmers here in Southwest Missouri. Uh, 
And our third partner is the USDA. And the USDA is a federal agency that, that uh, serves farmers of all scale here in, in the United States. And uh, USDA programs are available for small scale diversified farms for specialty crop farmers. I encourage anyone who's uh, interested in learning more about USDA programs to reach out to the Farm Services Agency office. There's one in, in most counties in Missouri and housed in that office in addition to FSA is the Natural Resources Conservation Service or NRCS and the Risk Management Agency or RMA. Both of these branches of the USDA have programs to help support small scale diversified agriculture. More information on all of these programs is available at the farmers.gov resources website. Well, in our time together tonight, here's what I'd like to do. We'll, we'll talk about why a farmer or a gardener might consider growing their own transplants. Then we'll talk about growing medium, you know, what, uh, what type of material you grow the transplants in. We'll talk about several production systems. Then we'll talk about seeds and seeding, watering, nutrition. We'll spend a little time talking about the environment and seedlings, looking at light and temperature. And then we'll talk about diseases and insects, and then we'll, we'll end up with some thoughts on preparing seedlings for life in the garden, on the farm, or in the, uh, the high tunnel or greenhouse. And as I mentioned, if there are any questions at any point, please enter them into the Q&A. Um, Anna will be keeping an eye on that, and I'll be pausing periodically to tackle those questions. Okay, so it is a fair question. Why grow transplants? It's another step in producing crops at, that a farmer has to undertake, and and uh, farmers are, are pretty busy as it is. So why would you consider adding another step in production and growing, growing your own transplants? Well, here are some good reasons. First of all, uniform seed germination. And particularly with high cost seed, growing transplants uh, with, with seed in a protected environment is an excellent way to most, make most effective use of that expensive seed. Secondly, it's a great way to protect seedlings as they begin growing. And in most cases, the most vulnerable growth stage of, of garden plants, vegetables, and, and fruit is when there are very young seedlings. And if we can grow these seedlings in a protected environment, uh, we can reduce some of the stresses, some of the, uh, the adverse environmental conditions that can negatively affect seedling growth. We can get these plants off to a great start. We can also eliminate variability that is inherent in direct seeding. When we plant a seed in the garden or in the high tunnel, it's exposed to, to environmental conditions from the very start. And in many cases, these environmental conditions may not be particularly favorable for germination and establishment. And so we end up with variable stands. We end up with skips. We end up with areas of heavy seedling growth. It's just not a uniform stand. And a non-uniform stand is an inefficient stand to manage. We can also, uh, you know, kind of expanding upon that, we can we can use transplants to develop perfect stands. And not only are these perfect stands uh, at optimal spacing, they're also at uniform physiological age. So we can predict with accuracy when that stand is going to be ready to harvest. And this is more difficult to do with direct seeding because oftentimes when, uh, when a farmer direct seeds, the seedlings germinate and grow at different rates. But by using transplants, you can ensure that all of the plants in a bed are at the, the same physiological age. There's also a shorter time from when they're planted in the field or the tunnel until harvest. You know, they've spent part of their life already being developed as a seedling under a protected environment. And then when we plant these seedlings out into the, uh, the field or the tunnel, they've you know, already shaved off as much as uh, six to eight weeks in the, uh, the length of time until it's time to harvest that crop. And that can be very helpful, particularly when we're, when we're slotting plants into rotations. And you know, if we have a rotation and we've finished, for example, a, a summer crop of tomatoes and we've cleared the tomatoes out of the tunnel and we want to start uh, a, a crop of uh, fall and, and winter greens, if we start by direct seeding into that area, we've automatically added a month onto the time it's going to take before those crops are ready to harvest. But by slotting uh, transplants that we already have on hand ready to go, we can be in production in a much shorter period of time in that valuable space in our garden, on our farm, or in our high tunnel. Transplants are useful for getting an early start in the spring and extending the growing season later in the fall. And almost invariably, farmers will see a benefit from the standpoint of enhanced yield and productivity using transplants versus direct seeding. 
there are some disadvantages. Uh, growing transplants, producing transplants is both labor and capital intensive. There is definitely a cost per transplant that's not there if you direct seed. Okay, the benefits we just mentioned, do they offset the, the labor and the capital? I would say in most cases, yes, but it is important to recognize that it does cost something in terms of labor and capital to grow seedlings. These seedlings may require specialized growing environments or specialized growing structures. And there is a cost in, in, in establishing and maintaining these, these special environments or special structures. So that has to be recognized as well. Now, <clears throat> we have a few plants in the garden that don't work particularly well from transplanting. These plants are difficult to transplant. They are actually better handled as direct seeded crops. Some of the root crops, for example, carrots and parsnips, are best handled as direct seeded in the garden. There are a number of leafy biennial herbs, such as dill and, and fennel, that work best as direct seeded plants. Uh, another one is, uh, is uh, cilantro. And then we have certain vegetables that, that we're planting out and we're expecting them to grow very quickly. We're going to harvest them either in, in a short period of time, even from direct seeding, or we're going to harvest them at a very early stage of growth, such as might be the case with baby greens or baby spinach. And in those cases, transplanting is not really worth the time and, and um, uh, effort, the, you know, both the, the time and the, the financial input to, to start these types of beds from transplanting. It's better to start these beds with with direct seeding. Now, why not buy transplants from a commercial grower? And certainly this is an option rather than growing them uh, yourself. If you need just a few plants, it's certainly an inexpensive way to go. There's no commitment and time and care on your part, but there are some disadvantages. Uh, there are lots of good growers out there, but there can be issues with the quality of the transplants or the seedlings. And you can inadvertently introduce diseases, insects, or weeds onto your farm when you're purchasing transplants from someone else. Frequently, the cultivar selection may be limited, and especially if you're growing something that is unique or, or just recently available, or perhaps an heirloom, uh, it, it may be a situation where you can't source these particular cultivars from a commercial grower. You may need to grow them yourself. And then the other thing to consider is timing. Um, you know, unless you contract, uh, arrange for a, a commercial grower to contract grow for you, you don't have a lot of control as far as the schedule of production for the uh, transplants from a commercial grower. Yes, it is an option to, to, uh, to develop a contract where the uh, commercial grower seeds according to your schedule, and that can be a good way to, to work around this issue. Um, and, and again, custom transplant production, which is what I just described, uh, is perhaps a way to, to do that. Now, keep in mind that a commercial grower is not going to want to do custom transplant production for a few hundred transplants. They're interested in, in quantity when it comes to custom production. Okay, so now we're going to spend some time talking about developing good transplants. All of the things that go into growing good transplants or good uh, seedlings for planting out into the field, into the tunnel, or into the greenhouse. And this is a kind of a nice diagram that came from Dr. Ajay Nair at Iowa State University. And we can see that that tomato transplant there in the middle and, and those bubbles, we want healthy transplants. We want transplants that have strong roots and shoots. We want transplants that have the potential to take off and grow once they're established in their final home. We want transplants that have no diseases or pests. And we want transplants that are ready to go, that, that are ready for that move out of the uh, seedling production phase into the field production phase. So that's really what it's all about. And we'll spend the next uh, few minutes talking about how to do just that. Okay, uh, an important thing to consider is what we are going to use to grow these transplants. What is the growing medium going to be? And you know, that the sort of the initial answer might be, well, why don't we just grow them in soil? They're gonna eventually be growing in soil, but there are some, some uh, things to consider when looking at growing mediums, and sometimes soil is not the best choice. So a good transplant production medium drains well and provides good aeration. We can see this handful of medium here. And, and even if, if this farmer were to take that handful and squeeze it, because of the characteristics of this medium, it would not be uh, a situation where it would be so dense that it wouldn't uh, provide good drainage and good aeration. It should have moderate water holding capacity. Yes, we want it to be well drained, but we also want the medium to hold moisture. Otherwise, we'll have to be uh, uh, focusing in a very serious way on 
watering management. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment, but having a medium that does have some water holding capacity gives us a little bit of leeway from the standpoint of timing our irrigations. In other words, uh, if we're a half hour or an hour or even several hours late in getting these seedlings watered, they'll be fine because there is water holding capacity in the medium. The medium should be free of insects, disease pathogens, nematodes, and weed seeds. And the medium should also provide a matrix for nutrients. In some cases, the nutrients are naturally present on the components in the medium. In other cases, we'll be applying fertilizers to the, the medium. And the medium should be such that it can latch onto those nutrients and hold them for use by the developing seedlings. So this is what we're looking for. Now, how do we get to that point? Well, <clears throat> in some cases, we can work with pre-mixed, pre-packaged mediums. And there are a number of, of sort of standard components that we see in these pre-packaged mediums. Frequently, there's an organic component, and frequently it's peat moss. It could be something else like core or shredded bark. Then there are components that, that help the, uh, the medium with the uh, uh, drainage and aeration qualities that we just described, and that could be something like perlite or vermiculite. And then in some cases, there's a wetting agent to enable the medium to wet adequately. Some mediums, particularly those that are primarily peat moss based, can be a challenge to moisten if they ever get completely dry. And having a wetting agent present in the medium can, can help with that particular situation. Now, as we look at these pictures here at the bottom, starting on the right, we have peat moss. Peat moss is harvested from peat bogs it's a decomposed plant material in various stages of decomposition. It's lightweight, it's generally sterile. It does everything that uh, we talked about in the previous slide as far as the qualities of the medium. The, the concern with peat moss is that um, uh, the harvest of peat moss from these peat bogs may not be as sustainable as we used to think. They're, in other words, we may be depleting that particular resource. If we look at the far left, we see core. And core is a byproduct of uh, coconut production. This is the husk that is around the coconut. And it is shredded and it can be used in much the same way that peat moss can be used. Keep in mind the core tends to have a, a, a higher level of salts and we have to be a little cautious from the standpoint of salt buildup in core-based uh, transplant medium. But it has been used in, in uh, as a substitute for peat moss and is generally considered to be more sustainable from the standpoint of production. In the middle, we see vermiculite and perlite. These are both mined materials that are heat treated. Uh, in the case of perlite, it's volcanic ash. In the case of vermiculite, it's a mineral. And then once they're heat treated, uh, they expand and they provide the, uh, the porosity that is important in growing mediums, again, to, to help with aeration and, uh, and um, uh, water drainage. Sometimes other ingredients are added to transplant mediums. These could be things such as washed granite sand, processed bark ash. Um, Typically, when we're working with transplants, the mediums are finely ground. If it's too coarse, it can interfere with the use of the medium in some of the production systems we'll be describing here in a moment. So frequently, the uh, growing mediums for transplant production are, are finely textured. We'll be talking about soil blocking in, in some length here in, in just a moment. And the medium that's used for uh, soil blocking is typically mixed on farm. It's not a pre-mix type thing. It's typically mixed on farm. And the recipe that is, is often used as a basis for um, soil blocking medium is the recipe developed by Elliot Coleman. And it's described in his book, The New Organic Grower. And the uh, major ingredients are, uh, um, let's see, hold on a moment. I think I just lost. Anna, do we still have uh, audio? Yes, it did change just now, but we've okay. been able to hear you. Yep, my, uh, my headphones just uh, conked out on me, so I'll just work with the computer. It still sounds good. Okay, very good, very good. Um, and again, the medium for soil blocking uh, has the major components as we see there, peat, sand, compost, and soil, and a number of other added amendments, lime, blood meal, colloidal phosphate, and green sand. And the goal with, with the soil blocking medium is a medium that will enable the soil block to remain uh, intact to, to preserve the integrity of the soil block because the soil blocks are not contained within any sort of pot or container. And so they tend to be a little bit denser than a typical growing medium. But again, with the right uh, mix, we still have those characteristics that we described earlier in a good growing medium. And here we can see the standard recipe from, from, uh, from L.A. Coleman. 
uh, 30 units of good quality peat moss, one eighth unit of lime, 20 units of coarse sand or perlite. Typically perlite is what's used because it's lighter in weight, but sand works as well. Three quarter unit of a base fertilizer, which is an equal part blood meal, colloidal phosphate and green sand mixture. And then 10 units of soil and 20 units of compost. And all of this is mixed thoroughly and then it's moistened. And for soil blocking to work, as we'll see a little bit later on in a demonstration, the mixture has to be moist, but not too moist. And so there's a bit of an art in, in properly moistening the uh, medium for, for soil blocking. In some cases, you can purchase medium that contains added nutrients. You know, an example of, of a medium with added nutrients is soil blocking medium, but you can also purchase pre-mixed, pre-packaged medium that has nutrients added to it. Those components that we described earlier, the peat moss, the perlite, and the vermiculite do not, do not uh, contribute appreciably to, uh, to nutrition for, for seedling growth. And so generally, if you're using a medium that just includes those components, nutrients either need to be added to the medium itself or they need to be added during the production of the seedling. And so again, some of these mediums might contain only major nutrients. In other cases, there may be mixes that include trace elements. And uh, you can actually contract for uh, special mediums if you're interested with commercial formulators. Now, it's a good practice to avoid slow release nitrogen in mediums that are being used for transplant production. Typically, we need nitrogen that is available quickly rather than a slow release type nitrogen. Uh, the reason that this note is here is that you can purchase mediums that do have slow release nitrogen mixed into them. Those are intended primarily for growing on plants that are going to stay in a pot or in some sort of bed for a long period of time. And in the case of seedlings, this is definitely not the case. Seedlings, yes, they spend some time being grown as seedlings, but eventually they're going to be planted out and slow release nitrogen is not particularly helpful with a seedling that will only be in its it container for, for four to, to eight weeks. If we have a medium that is non-charged, that doesn't contain added nutrients, then it's up to the grower to add the nutrients. And these can be added as, as dry nutrients as in a mixing process before the nutrients are placed in containers, or they can be applied as a liquid uh, fertilizer that's dissolved in water and then applied to the seedlings. This is actually the preferable way to deal with, with uh, nutritional management because the, the farmer knows exactly how much nutrition has been added. With a uh, charged medium, it's always a little bit uncertain. Yes, you've got a pretty good idea, but you know, was the medium thoroughly mixed with the nutrients? Uh, were there any other issues that might have affected the availability of those nutrients? But if the farmer is charging the medium themselves, then they know exactly what the situation is. Now, what about using soil? Uh, as we saw in the uh, soil blocking uh, mixture, there is a soil component there. What about using just straight soil? Well, in general, straight soil is not commonly used in transplant production. First of all, it's heavy, and oftentimes when it's been, been uh, uh, prepared for, for placing into pots or some other sort of container, it ends up being compacted and having poor drainage. If you do plan to use soil or, or a soil component in a medium, generally the uh, the soil is, is sterilized, oftentimes with steam or heat before it's used. This is to eliminate any pathogens that might be present in that soil, things such as uh, pathogenic fungi, pathogenic bacteria, nematodes, other pests that might, uh, might uh, attack and destroy developing seedlings. Okay, do we have any questions at this point, Anna? Not right now. Okay. Well, again, as I mentioned, uh, please uh, contribute questions to the Q&A and we will tackle them. Okay, now we're going to spend a little time talking about production systems, you know, how, how a farmer would put together a system to grow transplants. And there's different approaches to this. And we'll be talking about uh, the use of, of uh, uh, containers and flats as we see in this picture, but we'll also be talking about soil blocking and, and uh, using paper pots. We'll talk a little bit about uh, using natural pots and uh, 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 also, we'll talk a bit about uh, production systems actually using in-ground production. We'll be focusing on sweet potatoes there. Okay, so oftentimes farmers start with conventional trays and cell flats, and this is based upon plastic, and we are growing transplants in either hardened plastic or in polystyrene. Now, there's some advantages to this approach. It's very easy and quick to fill 
these trays and these cell flats. In other words, we can have an area ready to seed in very quickly. They tend to be lightweight. They tend to be easily moved around. And this could be helpful. They're a standard size, so you can build benches to, to fit the standard sizes. They can be used with mechanical transplanters. Typically, this is not an on-farm on consideration, but in larger scale production, uh, the actual uh, process can be mechanized. And the, uh, the uh, trays, and in some cases, the flats, can be reused for many seasons if they're handled carefully, stored out of direct sunlight. Now, the downside, uh, they need to be stored and cleaned before they can be reused. If you're going to reuse them, it's important that they be cleaned and sanitized before you place the medium in and, and, and seed the plants in there. It's very easy for seedlings to become root bound in many of these types of trays and cell flats. And then when these root bound seedlings are pulled out, there's transplant shock when they're removed from the cells. As we'll see here in a moment, there are ways around this issue, but uh, with the, the more standard types, this is, is a very real concern. And it's very important not to allow seedlings to stay too long in the plastic cells. Eventually the, uh, the trays and the flats wear out and they need to be replaced. And generally when they do, they cannot always be recycled. In some cases, yes, but in other cases, no. And if they can't be recycled, they usually end up being burned or being placed into landfills, both of which have environmental costs. Hey, Patrick, we do have one question. Yes. Uh, can you suggest if a specific, can you suggest a specific mix that could be purchased locally? Uh, you know, I, well, yes and no. So in, in my position as an extension specialist, I, I try not to recommend specific brands, but I will say that there are several standard mixes, again, that contain peat moss, perlite, and vermiculite that are widely available. I've seen them at our, our uh, 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 home improvement discounting type stores. I've also seen them at local nurseries and at, at uh, places like Nixa Hardware. So you should be able to source these without difficulty here in Southwest Missouri. You can also, of course, mix your own because you can source the components, the peat moss, the perlite, and the vermiculite, and mix your own. So uh, you shouldn't have any difficulty finding these materials for use. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, very good, very good. Uh, let's talk first about polystyrene. And polystyrene is very similar to, to uh, styrofoam. And these tend to be uh, cells that can be used for several seasons. They're reasonably durable if you take care of them. Generally, they have an inverted pyramid-shaped cell that tapers towards the bottom. This allows you to remove the uh, plant and the uh, medium from the cell without difficulty. They can have very tiny cells, as, as small as 0.8 inch square or as large as six inches square. So it's a lot of variety. And they are, are described from the standpoint of the number of cells per container. So for example, if you have one and a half inch cells, that's going to be 128 cell tray. And a tray with two and a half inch cells has 72 cells. So you'll see them described as, as a, a 128 or a 72. Now this is an example of a polystyrene tray. Plastic containers. Uh, typically, uh, plastic containers are made up of two parts. You have a reusable plastic tray or flat, and then you have inserts. And the inserts, yes, they can be used more than once, but they are generally a very thin plastic, and it can be a challenge to effectively clean and disinfect these inserts without damaging them. So in many cases, the inserts are only used once. The uh, tray is generally a standard 1020 tray. What that means is that the dimensions of that tray um, at the base are 20 inches by 10 inches. And in, 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 as, as far as the footprint, a 1020 tray actually occupies about 21 inches by 11 inches. And in, in the case of um, this type of, a, of an approach, these inserts are very close together and there's typically more cells per tray than a similar polystyrene tray. So in other words, you can pack more plants into the same amount of space on a bench compared to a polystyrene container. Now, again, there's a variety of, uh, of uh, inserts available, and the most common ones are 128s, 98s, 72s, or 50s, but there's lots and lots of variations on the theme that fit into a 1020 tray. Smaller cells, generally, again, reduce production cost, and, uh, and the, uh, you know, there's, there's less involved from the standpoint of the cost of the inserts and the trays and the medium, but it is only suitable, you know, smaller cells are only suitable for small transplant size, and and oftentimes they're not particularly helpful in developing 
uh, larger transplants. And the larger transplants, you know, uh, vegetables, uh, a good example would be tomatoes, have to have a certain amount of root volume in which to grow. And so you, you don't want to make the mistake of putting vegetables into, into cells that are, are too small for them. Larger cells have higher production costs, enhance earliness and quality in larger transplants. So which size cell or block to use? Well, the smaller ones, those would be suitable for cold crops or lettuce. The larger ones for things like tomatoes, peppers, watermelon, muskmelon, cucumbers, and squash. So again, those very small uh, cells are gonna be used for, for um, first of all, smaller stature transplants, but also transplants that don't spend as much time in the cell before they're transplanted out into the uh, uh, field, the high tunnel or the garden. And here's a, again, a, another um, uh, table that talks about appropriate tray sizes for different types of vegetables. And again, uh, this will be available in the recording and, and feel free to refer back to this. And here's just a picture showing some of the different sizes of cells. And you can see a 72 cell there at the bottom, the smaller 128 cell there, and then 50 cells there, and, and even some very large cells like a three inch cell. And again, these are arranged in, in uh, uh, dimensions that they fit into that 1020 tray. Now, we're seeing an increased interest in using what are called single piece plastic flats. These are not, these are, are, are more durable than the inserts in uh, 1020 flats. And uh, they can be used for, for more than one growing season. And again, they're typically about the same size there. I mean, they, they can be larger, typical size is 13 by 26, but I've also seen um, single piece plastic flats that are the same dimension as a 1020 flat. Uh, they have rigidity, you know, they're, they're durable, they stand up to, to moving around, and they don't, as I said before, require the, uh, the uh, second component when you're using those more, more thin-walled inserts. Again, they're reusable, and uh, they're, they're durable, and they can be used for multiple seasons. Here's a couple of examples of what are called windstrip trays. And windstrip trays are interesting. You can see in the uh, picture in the center, you have small squares and large squares, and the uh, medium is placed in the large squares. And uh, when you fill the flats, the medium drops out of the small squares. And the small squares are kept open, and you'll notice a fairly large uh, opening on the bottom of the windstrip tray. And what this does is um, it allows the, the seedling, as it develops, when the roots come into contact with that open area at the bottom, to go through a process called root pruning. And whenever roots reach the edge of a medium that's exposed to the air, they will kind of stop growing at that point and then begin to branch out and grow within the medium. And this is helpful because it lessens the issue with, with uh, uh, that huge mass of roots around the outside of the cell that we sometimes see with plastic inserts. And it also uh, gives us transplants that are less prone to transplant shock when they're moved out of the flat and then planted into the, the high tunnel, the field, or the garden. Now, uh, a quick note about uh, keeping your trays and your flats clean if you're going to reuse them. Typically, the first use is fine because they generally arrive with in, in a clean and sterile condition, but after they've been used, then it's important to think about sanitation. And we can use these many times. And the easiest way to sanitize them is, first of all, spray off all of the loose soil and medium that might be present on them. You know, Try to get them as clean as you can. A good way to do this is with a, uh, uh, a pressure sprayer and do this outside and just spray all the debris off of them and then dip them into a 10% chlorine bleach solution and allow them to sit in that solution for a period of time, you know, several minutes. This will disinfect the, uh, the uh, uh, trays and the cell flats and then take them out and thoroughly rinse them in clean water to uh, remove any trace of chlorine. Chlorine can be detrimental to, to seedling growth, so you don't want any, any residue of chlorine behind on the uh, the polystyrene or the plastic. Polystyrene is particularly tricky about that. But rinse them really well and rinse away all the chlorine and then let them dry and store them somewhere out of the sun. And again, if you use them carefully, particularly something like a windstrip tray, you can use them for many years. Um, uh, sort of a, a scale up from the standpoint of conventional trays and cell flats is plastic pots. And here we can see an example of, of uh, tomato transplants in plastic pots. And in this case, we're still dealing with the standard 1020 tray size, but you can see we're able to get uh, eight 
well, no, it actually looks like 10 pots within that, that space. And so we can certainly move up into larger scale containers to grow larger transplants if we desire. Okay, now let's turn our attention to soil block production. And here's a couple of pictures, first of all, on the, uh, the uh, left showing a parsley plant in an individual soil block. And on the right, we can see basil plants growing in soil blocks within a 1020 flat. And this could be a very effective way to grow transplants. It's um, an approach where you control the components in your mix because you, you mix it yourself. And you'll notice that there is airspace around the soil blocks. And that airspace, again, allows for the root printing that we talked about earlier. And it allows for a, for a, a much reduced transplant shock when these uh, little seedlings are then transplanted into the, the uh, garden or the, uh, the uh, field. Again, advantages, excellent seedling production due to this root pruning. It is labor intensive and it can be somewhat finicky. As I mentioned before, the uh, uh, water balance, the moisture balance in the mix when making soil blocks is critical. If it's too wet, the blocks become compacted. If it's too dry, the blocks don't hold together. So it takes a little bit of practice to get good at, at moistening the medium to the right level. And, and it is labor intensive, as we'll see here in a moment. It takes a long time to generate an equivalent number of transplant sites compared to, say, using a plastic insert and a flat. Uh, we, we saw the recipe for uh, soil block production earlier on. And using that, that uh, mixture, we, we moisten it. And generally, we use about one part of tepid water, warm water, for every three parts of blocking mix. We want to mix this thoroughly. It's, it's helpful to mix it in a container such as we see here. And the mix should, should, again, be somewhat like wet cement. You don't want it like soft cement, but definitely like wet cement so that when you're making the soil blocks, a little bit of water oozes out. And when you make it, of course, uh, you'll know very quickly if you're able to, to produce blocks that will maintain their integrity. And if they're too dry, well, add some more water. If the mix is too wet, then add a bit of dry mix to it and, and keep mixing it until you're at the right um, level of, of moisture. Now, common soil block sizes are one and a half, two, and three inch. There's also what are called growing on systems where you can start transplants in a very small mini block. And then with uh, certain types of soil block makers, you can actually make blocks that have a space to plug the mini block into a two inch block, and then eventually a two inch block into a four inch block if you're so inclined. So there are, are it is possible to have growing on systems with, with soil blocks, but in most cases, you're going to work with a soil block size that is appropriate for the particular type of transplant you're producing. You're not gonna be doing this growing on uh, type approach. So some examples of soil block sizes for uh, particular types of transplants, that very small three quarter inch block, that's going to be for a seed uh, seedling that you'll transplant into a larger block. One and a half inch blocks work great for coal crops, lettuce and onions. Two inch blocks work good for beans, peas, corn and squash. Three inch blocks for squash, corn, cucumbers and melons. And four inch blocks for eggplant, pepper and tomato. Well, let's take a look at a video now. And this is a video of uh, of uh, the actual process of making the soil blocks. The, the mix has already been mixed up and it's been moistened. And now we'll see how to actually make the soil blocks. Okay, Anna, can we see the, uh, the video now? Yep, it looks good. Okay, let's go ahead and start her off. This is one of, the, one of the smaller ones. This is a one and a half inch block um, and there's five. You can see over there, that's a two inch block and there's only four. Are they, does it matter for seed which one gets which five? Yeah, definitely. So I tend to do like heavy feeders and um, like summer fruiting crops like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. Those all get the two inches because they're gonna go through that food a lot more quickly because they're heavy feeders than something like um, a red Russian kale or um, a head of lettuce or something, they do just fine in these. I can get those transplanted out before they run out pretty easy. So yeah, like I said, um, you don't want it to be sopping wet. And that's kind of the dance with this, to like just get just the right amount of moisture. Um, as Patrick was explaining earlier, you're like too dry, too dry, too dry. And then you add a little bit more water and then you're like, oh no, I threw it, like the whole thing's messed up. And then you gotta add a little bit more. But I think I found a mix that works pretty well. 
Uh, what you want to do is use, I mean, a considerable amount of force. You want these things to be pretty packed. Um, and this is such a loamy, fluffy um, mix that you're not going to like, you're not going to compact to the point that the roots are having a difficult time. Okay. Um, it is important. You saw how I was kind of scraping it along the bottom. Yeah. You want contact with the bottom like that so that this is flat. Because if you put it in your flat and it's bold at the bottom, it's going to be wobbly. Um, and then, yeah, you set it wherever your destination flat is. And I usually just give it like a little bit of a squeeze before I go for it, just kind of like compress it a little bit more. And then you just let go. And then you should have a block that stays together pretty well. Yeah. And then you seed into it. And usually, I mean, depending on what it is, I'll cover it with a little bit of the same mix or compost or something. And then you see behind you, there's a parsley on the table. Um, once it grows up, um, it looks like that. And then you just drop that right into whatever furrow or um, open hole you made in your bed. Okay, well, let's go ahead and return to the uh, the uh, presentation. Does anyone have any questions on soil blocking? Not right now. Okay. And again, if you have any questions, please bring uh, record, pop, pop them into the Q and A at, at any point. Okay, now let's talk about paper pot production. And this is, is a, a, an interesting way to grow transplants and it's done as a system. You have to do everything right to make it work. But if you do a good job of developing uh, paper pot transplants, then you can use a transplanter to actually place them in the field or in the high tunnel. And so let's go ahead and watch a video on paper pot production. Okay, bear with me just a moment because I've got to call up another video here. Okay, let's go ahead and share screen and, and watch this second video. Looks good. Okay. And I want to thank my my uh, friend uh, Curtis Millsap, who uh, narrated the, his way through uh, paper potting here with us. It's a high quantity of baby plants, and so for the last several years, we have grown. Well, actually, almost since we started, we've soil block beets for our first round, and those are always the best beets. I mean, they're beautiful beets because we have them properly spaced and we have them, um, uh, you know, we're, we're making sure that the, the plants are where we want them and in rows and all those things, which makes it easier to care for them. Um, whereas when we direct seed, we always either get too heavy or too light. And it's, it's almost never just right. Um, the other thing that have, causes that, which the beer pot doesn't necessarily fix, is that beets, each beet, uh, and, uh, and it works pretty well. Uh, we've also played around with Vermont compost, which comes from Vermont. It's a little awkward. It's not very handy at all. Uh, and honestly, our results haven't been that much better. And uh, so, and, and we do, we actually, usually with the uh, with the OM1 from Berger, we mix it 50-50 with sifted uh, City of Springfield compost. They make a really nice compost. It's really, uh, really nice texture. And, and so we found that to be really match and get really good growth out of those. So um, obviously these are small cells, so you got to have a pretty good media or you're going to have problems because they're going to run out of nutrients pretty quick. Um, when we do lettuce, especially in the spring, when we may end up holding it a little longer than we'd like to, uh, we will fertigate with some fish emulsion or uh, some uh, nature source, which is a seed meal uh, nitrogen source. Okay. All right, so this is a dibble, all right? Probably the fanciest dibble you'll ever see. Um, a dibble is any tool that is used to poke a hole in the soil. So there you go. Wait, can't you use it? Do some dibbles poke holes in other things? All dibbles are soil dibbles. This dibble in particular. So um, obviously, pretty specialized. Uh, again, you know, it's part of a system. 
So what happens here, now that we press down, and uh, I, was, I was making sure to line up everything with the cells, and now I've got a perfect little hole in each cell, right? And so we've kind of been trying to find our replacement ever since then. And we haven't really yet found it, but so we're still playing around a little bit. Let's see what you know. uh, it's very satisfying. Um, so this is called the drop seeder. Um, okay, now that I've shuffled everything around, there's you know two or three seeds in each hole. Now I could use a smaller one and I could get them to singulate. Uh, in spinach, I don't really need to do that. Spinach has a fairly low germination rate, especially in the summer. So it's likely that we'll just get one plant to two plants in each cell. That's not a problem. Um, but if I wanted to, I could use a smaller one and that would, that would sing to me. Um, so so I you know, shake it out across there and then I bring it back. So all my seeds are, my extra seeds are just residing over there. And now there's two sets of holes in this. There's the holes on the bottom, which are slightly bigger, quite a bit bigger. And then there's the holes on the top that are just the right size for the seeds. And so now I'm gonna line up the bottom holes with the dibble holes. Shift this top plate scoots over like that, and there we go. Germinating them until they're till they're reasonable sized plants, and if they aren't, they'll die pretty quickly on you. Which is interesting because they also, if they stay too wet, much after that they'll start damping off. So it's a it's always a they're like fingers. Yeah, <laughs> I also have mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So we just seeded. We'll do 528 spinaches in that amount of time. Um, so we need to have these planted before sundown. Right? On top of the seed, we want to keep those seeds really nice and wet. Uh, Courtney, would you plop one of those down there? And just put the water in it. I'm gonna grab this tree right here. Mm -hmm. So this is the point where we take the metal spacing frame out because now we've done everything we need to do to that tray. We don't want to take it out much before that because it tends to, once you get the soil in, it's pretty stable, but if you do it before you put the spake soil, put the soil in, it just shrinks right back. That's Learn that the hard way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Turns out that's not what you want to do. How, yeah. many, how many is that per tray then? 264. So it's, yeah, it's a weird number. Would you ever want just 100? Per Fresh out of the sharp stick pile and uh, I'm going to pin this first plant in place. You can do it by just holding it in place too, but I can't pull and hold at the same time. So. Mm -hmm. Very nice seeing both kind of mess, uh, methods or two different tools for the soil uh, blocking. Exactly. exactly. Do we have any questions about uh, paper pot production? We do. Uh, <laughs> someone says that their understanding is that paper pots are finicky with soil conditions. Um, and they're wondering what we can expect with occasional gravels. I, I would agree. They, especially the transplanting process, as you saw the the uh, bed that uh, Curtis had prepared was uh, a very well prepared bed and it had a layer of compost on it. And yes, uh, for, for best performance, uh, it's, it's best not to have rocks or, or, or large gravel present because it will, you know, it, it could cause the uh, transplanter to move side to side, but it can also cause the, uh, uh, the seedlings to be popped up out of the ground if they hit a rock. So it really works best as an overall system where not only are you producing the seedlings, you know, under all of these steps, but you're also putting them into a bed that has been properly prepared. And having a bed with, with compost layer or a finely, finely worked layer on top is, is generally what's best for, for paper pot transplanting. 
And one more question, are growing with paper pots considered organic? Well, that's a question to ask uh, your certifier. In most cases, they are considered organic because the paper that's used is biodegradable. And I have not heard of any problems or concerns related to whether or not uh, paper pots would be, would be organic certifiable, but that's a question for your certifier. Do we have additional questions? Nope, that's all at this time. Okay, well, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so this picture shows a close-up of the uh, uh, a partially dispensed paper pot flat. And again, you can see the uh, small size of the cells and the uh, seedlings are generated in strips. And then as you saw in the, uh, in the video, as you transplant them, the strip just pulls out and you end up with a long line of uh, seedlings that are held in place by the, uh, the paper cups. The bottom of the cup is open. This allows for that rip printing, which is helpful in, in uh, developing good quality seedlings. These are small cells and it's best not to allow the uh, transplants to stay too long in those cells because they will quickly exhaust any nutrients that are present in the mix and they can become root bound even though we've allowed for root pruning. Uh, biodegradable pot production used to be um, a larger scale approach to transplant production. And this is where transplants were grown in uh, pots made of compressed peat. Um, they do eliminate transplant shock. They're, they're easy to plant and they don't leave behind anything that, that uh, has to be recycled, uh, that is unrecyclable. In other words, plastic. But on the, uh, the downside, obviously you have to start a new each season. They require some sort of carrying tray. They're not as space efficient in the greenhouse and seedlings can become pot bound or root bound in these uh, biodegradable uh, containers. Uh, there's very little commercial scale production of, of biodegradable pot production. This is mainly an approach that is used in home gardens. And then a few thoughts on field production. There are some cases where we can actually generate transplants by, by growing things in the field. And a good example is sweet potatoes, as we see here. Now, with sweet potatoes, um, Common, we, we start with roots from the previous season's crop. And I've got a couple of blanks here because uh, there's some disagreement as far as how you should pre-sprout these, uh, these roots. But typically you want to pre-sprout them at a warm temperature somewhere around 80 to 85 degrees and at fairly high relative humidity, somewhere between 80 to 90%. And then you place, uh, after you've pre-sprouted these roots for about two to three weeks, then you place them in a bed, uh, a field bed. Typically the bed is in a in a high tunnel or some sort of protected structure. And then you cover the roots with compost. And then the entire bed now, you know, the compost covered roots can be covered with a piece of plastic and frequently with a piece of row cover. Again, the goal here is to provide a warm growing environment so that we can generate slips quickly. The slips are allowed to grow. If you have a plastic piece over the bed, then you slit the plastic and pull it back as the slips begin to grow. Once the slips reach about four to six inches, then the tips are cut back and they're allowed to regrow. And uh, then the uh, slips are harvested when they're about six to 10 inches long. And these beds can be very productive. We have a project underway where we were measuring slip uh, production on different approaches. And typically we, we were able to harvest somewhere between 40 to 90 slips per square foot from a bed. So again, it can be very productive. When you harvest the slips, don't pull them. You wanna cut them above the soil by doing so, you leave behind any, uh, any pathogens that might be present in the soil, and you're just taking a clean slip away, and then that slip is transplanted into the, uh, the bed or the, the field or the high tunnel where the sweet potatoes are going to be grown. And again, this composite just shows the process. In the upper left, we're spreading sweet potatoes out on our beds. The upper right, we've spread compost on top of the sweet potatoes, and we've covered them up. Lower right, we can see the very first slips beginning to pop through and we've split back the plastic. And then the uh, lower left is uh, slips uh, growing well underneath row cover. And then in, in the center, that's the bed. And this would be the bed typically about, oh, six to eight weeks after the sweet potatoes were, were started. So again, slips can be grown in, in, in short order using this approach. 
Okay, do we have any questions at all about any of these production systems? Doesn't look like it right now. Okay, uh, we'll talk just a little bit about seeds and seeding. You know, as we saw in the demonstration of paper potting, um, at some point we're gonna be placing seeds into our, our uh, transplant environment. And it's very important that we, we, we use good quality seed. You know, we put time and effort and money into choosing a medium and developing a production system we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot by using poor quality seed. So again, this old adage, good quality seed does not cost, it pays, is certainly true in growing transplants. And poor quality seed can lead to low germination rates. It can also lead to poor quality transplants. Now, uh, increasingly, we're seeing interest in what are called seed treatments. And these are treatments that uh, enhance seed germination or eliminate uh, pathogens or other things that might slow down or damage seeds. And we actually have a recording of an earlier workshop on seed and seed management that's available at the Springfield Community Gardens YouTube site. So check that out for an in-depth discussion of seeds and seed treatments. But just quickly, we have heat treatments in place that can eliminate bacteria and viruses that might be on seed coats. We also have pelletized seed, uh, particularly with very small seed, like uh, well, some of the herb seeds, for example, they can be pelleted to make them much easier to manage. We can also have seeds that are, that are primed or pre-germinated. They've been treated with moisture and then dried back so that they stop, but they still have uh, started the germination process. And when they're planted, we have more uniform seedling emergence. We can also have treatments of fungicides or insecticides on seed, again, to eliminate pests that might damage the seed or the developing seedling. Now some tips on uh, getting your, your transplants off to a good start. Make sure that you moisten the medium before packing trays or cells, or in the case of something like a, a, a paper pot, again, you want to, to moisten that uh, fairly quickly after you place the seeds. But in most cases, you're going to pre-moisten the medium before you pack the trays or cells. And we certainly saw that in the case of the uh, soil block production. But in the case of using plastic inserts and trays, it's a good practice to pre-moisten the medium. It's much easier then to further moisten that medium uh, after you've planted the, uh, the seeds in, in place. And uh, if you have difficulty moistening medium, it can be helpful to use warm or hot water even to, to speed up the process. Then you fill the cells, you uniformly impact and level the medium, use a dibble as we saw to make an indentation in each cell. The soil blockers, uh, they already have a pin that makes that little dimple that you saw in the uh, soil blocks in the video. And then the seeds are placed in the, in the indentation or in the, in the uh, the dimple, and then they're covered with a fine medium. Typically what's used is a very fine peat moss or vermiculite. And then they're watered thoroughly. Uh, if warm water is available, this is the best, uh, and it's best to use warm water. They can be watered from below, as we saw in the uh, video of uh, paper pot production, or they can be watered from above. But if you're watering from above, use a very gentle stream, perhaps even a mist to do this. And if you're watering soil blocks, be cautious about uh, directed streams of water because you can you can destroy the integrity of the soil block if you have too much pressure behind the water that you're using to water the soil blocks. We can also improve germination and early plant growth by growing seedlings on heat mats. And this is a bench here that has a heat mat placed on it. You can't actually see the heat mat because it's underneath that layer of fabric, but you can see the thermostat there at the end of the bench. And by maintaining a uniform warm temperature at the base of the flats, we can actually encourage more uniform and more, uh, more quick germination of seeds that are placed in those flats. So a common practice to use uh, heat mats. Now, some heat mats are electrical, you know, using uh, uh, electrical resistance wires that are embedded in mats. In other cases, uh, warm water can be used in, in a sort of a hydrothermic approach to keeping the uh, uh, bottoms of the bases of the flats warm. But this can be very helpful in uh, encouraging rapid germination and a good plant growth early on. <clears throat> we can also get seeds off to a good start by using germination chambers. And a germination chamber is a specialized chamber where the farmer can very carefully control temperature, relative humidity, and moisture. And uh, the, the uh, use of a germination chamber is uh, particularly helpful with, with difficult to germinate seeds or seeds that we're trying to germinate 
during a period of time where they would not normally be germinating. And so the classic case is spinach. And spinach germinates at cool temperatures. And if we're trying to establish a, a late spring or a late summer crop of spinach, we're trying to germinate seed during a period of time where the temperatures are too warm in the high tunnel or, or, or elsewhere. So it can be helpful to have a germination chamber where we can, we can germinate that spinach at a lower temperature. Once the seedlings are up and growing, then we can move the seedlings out into the, the, the more normal temperature at that time. But a germination chamber can be very helpful. Uh, you also, uh, if you're using it, uh, uh, an enclosed contained chamber, you don't have to, to control the temperature in an entire high tunnel or greenhouse to the optimum germination temperature. You just focus on that enclosed space in the germination chamber. Now, once the seedlings have, uh, the, the roots of the seeds have cracked the seed coat, it's time to move the trays out of the germination chamber. So you've got to monitor these fairly closely. You don't want to leave the uh, germinating seeds inside the chamber for any period of time because frequently we don't have good light uh, exposure in the uh, germination chamber. We don't need it. But if seedlings begin to grow in the germination chamber in, uh, in low light conditions, they become excessively long, they get leggy and they, they're poor quality. So again, leave them in the chamber only as long as they need to be left. Here's a, an example of a germination chamber. Uh, this is a, a, a converted uh, cooler. And you can see at the very bottom, there's a heat source. The next shelf up has a, a pan of water to provide humidity. And then above that are the shelves that have the germinating flats on. Over on the right, we see the thermostat that controls the, uh, the uh, heat source within the chamber. Again, very, careful, very important to have careful control of temperature and relative humidity to provide those conditions that are optimum for seed germination. On the left, we have another example of a germination chamber, and this is basically a converted drink cooler. And uh, again, the farmer has set it up so you can see behind the, the door there, you can see the pan of water. There's also a heat source in there as well. Looking on the right, we see a table that gives us optimum germination temperatures for particular vegetables. And again, I'll point out spinach there towards the bottom, which 45 to 75 degrees is, is uh, typically cooler than we, we frequently have during the summer or, or the early fall in the greenhouse. And so we can get much better germination of spinach in a chamber where we can keep the temperatures cooler. Here's the stage where you wanna pull the seeds out of the germination chamber. Again, you can see that the roots have cracked the seed and they're starting to, to move their way into the soil block. Now it's time to take them out of the germination chamber. It can be helpful to have a growing environment for seeds and seedlings as well. And here we see an example of a small greenhouse that's been developed to grow seedlings in. And the benefit of this, of course, is that particularly early in the season or late in the season where you may need to warm the, the growing environment to get good seedling growth, it can be helpful to have an environment, a smaller environment than say a full, full tunnel area that you have to manage the temperature in. So again, a small structure like this, we can very carefully monitor the temperature. You'll also notice the nozzles that are hanging above the flats. Those are going to be uh, uh, set up on an automatic timer to mist the flats. This will be how we'll water the flats in this particular uh, seed starting structure. Now, this was a demonstration structure. We hadn't actually used it yet. That's why you kind of see things piled up there. But I think you can get the concept of how even a small space like this can produce a lot of transplants. Watering. So again, watering is critical. Seedlings are extremely vulnerable to, to damage from uh, being allowed to get too dry and to wilt. So again, we want to irrigate whenever the surface of the media becomes dry. When we're irrigating from above, we want to apply water until we can see it dripping out of the bottom of the flats. And whenever possible, try to do your irrigations early in the day so that uh, we don't have moisture on the leaves as we move into nightfall. If wet leaves at night are just an invitation to disease issues. So try to water early in the day. Now, again, as, as time goes on, temperatures get warmer and transplants get larger, more water is needed. So you're going to have to adjust your, your watering schedules as you move through the season. As we see in this, this picture here, it just takes a short period of time for uh, plants to suffer uh, damage in, in a transplant situation, particularly when you're using small cell sizes as you use with some of the smaller inserts or you use with, with a paper pot type approach. So again, you wanna be monitoring watering very closely. Now, as you're uh, taking plants to the field, 
and you're hardening them off, which we'll talk about here in a moment, then you want to apply slightly less water, but you still don't want seedlings to wilt. So never allow your media to become completely dry. You know, I, I bolded and underlined the fact that adequate water is absolutely necessary for, for optimum growth of vegetable transplants. So important to manage irrigation frequencies. And more and more farmers are automating an irrigation setup. And by doing so, they, they ensure that these plants are watered on a regular schedule. But, but keep in mind that, uh, yes, you can set up an automated system, but be sure that you verify it. It takes just one warm afternoon without water on to, to damage or destroy a whole structure full of seedlings. Watering by hand, of course, is labor intensive and expensive. It's also, you, you would think that watering by hand, you would have the best control as far as uniformity, but it's actually the least uniform of all systems. And generally it's only practical when you're growing a relatively small number of transplants. Again, if you have to spend all of your time watering transplants and they may need to be watered four or five times a day, you're not gonna get much else done. So hence the interest in automating uh, watering for transplants. Here's an example of, of non-uniform watering. And we see that, that flat in the front there, you notice how the corner, the, uh, the uh, transplants have actually died and along the edges. These are the areas that are missed when, when hand water. So if you're hand watering transplants, pay particular attention to the edges and make sure that they get adequately watered. So automated watering. Uh, typically, uh, these are stationary or solid set systems. Uh, yeah, on most farms, they're, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, relatively inexpensive to develop. You're typically using mist nozzles and uh, most farmers construct their own and then they, they're put onto timers to uh, precisely control the, the uh, timing and the, the amount, the length of time that, uh, that irrigations are left on. And as I mentioned, as seedlings grow, as the season progresses, the scheduling will need to be adjusted accordingly. In some cases, these nozzles, uh, this approach can be used to distribute fertilizers and pesticides as well. So again, here's an example on a small scale in a seed starting structure. You can see the uh, overhead solid set system. And these are, are uh, mist sprinklers. They're, they're, uh, they, they put out a, a circular pattern of water and it's important that you have enough overlap in the circular pattern that you don't have dry spots. And again, trial and error will, will help you figure out what that looks like. Here's an example of a movable system. Now, granted, this is large scale transplant production, but a similar approach could be used in smaller scale as well. But this particular system is set up to move over the top of the transplants and then to apply water, again, at a uniform rate without missing any plants. And the system is set up on a timer so that the, uh, the uh, irrigation structure moves down and then it moves back and then it moves down again at a rate appropriate for the water needs of those transplants. Important that you use quality water when you're watering transplants. Uh, poor quality water can cause all kinds of problems. Important to test your water before you begin production. And if anyone ever wants a, an opinion on a water test, please reach out. I'd be happy to look at that and give you some thoughts on the suitability of that water for watering transplants. Uh, there, there are desirable ranges for elements, but particularly for soluble salts and alkalinity from the standpoint of the water being suitable. And typically we want water that is slightly acidic. A pH of five to seven is, is desirable. And again, another table just to give you a feel for what desirable ranges would be in irrigation water, again, without the addition of fertilizer. Obviously, if you add fertilizer to water, that changes uh, the, these, these amounts. But with water as it comes from the, uh, from the source, these are the desirable ranges that we're looking for. Fertility management. So our goal from the standpoint of fertility management is to grow stocky, sturdy, medium green plants that transplant and grow well in the field. And this sounds easy enough, but it can be a challenge, particularly if we're working with small sized cells and we're working with transplants that grow quickly. Now, transplants are usually fertilized with soluble fertilizers. And these are dissolved in a stock solution and then applied either by hand or by injecting into irrigation this is called fertigation. There are organic options. There are also conventional options. The important thing is that it be soluble and that it not damage the uh, transplants if it contacts their foliage. And a typical fertilizer, either an organic or a conventional, will include nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sometimes other nutrients as well. 
And as far as when to begin fertilizing, if we have charged the media, then we can delay fertilizing by one or two weeks. But typically with non-charged media, we wanna start fertigating when the first true leaves begin to develop. If you remember back to the uh, pictures we saw of the, uh, the uh, squash and, and cucumbers, those very first uh, organs that we see, those are what are called seed leaves. Those are not true leaves. But then in the middle of those seed leaves, we'll see a little shoot come out. And the first leaf that unfolds on that shoot is the actual true leaf. So when we see that first true leaf, it's time to start fertilizing. And again, some examples, uh, we see a soluble fertilizer there on the right. On the left, this is an apparatus that actually injects the fertilizer solution into the, the irrigation system. So we're essentially doing two jobs at once by doing this with both watering and fertilizing. And uh, uh, it can be a very effective way to, to uh, apply fertilizer to, to transplants. Now, how much fertilizer? Uh, typically the target is based upon nitrogen. And if you're injecting fertilizer into the irrigation stream, typically somewhere around 30 to 50 parts per million with every watering as usual. Now, peppers, tomatoes, coal crops, we, we oftentimes use something towards the higher end of that, that rate range. Cucurbits will be down near the lower end of that rate range. Now, in order to, to do this right, obviously you have to understand how to do fertilizer calculations. And I'm not gonna go through that now, but that's pretty straightforward. And again, if, if anyone wants to talk further about looking at rates, please reach out and we can do that. You can also conduct an electrical conductivity test periodically on your medium to make sure that you haven't accumulated salts. And particularly if there are dissolved salts in your water source, you've got to be cautious about that. And looking at this picture here, we can see the, the impact of, of irrigation water that is too high in salts on these, uh, these uh, uh, plants growing in, in paper pot. Okay, do we have any questions at this point, Anna? No, I think you're hitting all the high points here. Okay, well, let's turn our attention to light. Now, in most cases with transplant production on small scale diversified farms, we're growing in a structure where we have plenty of light. But there are sometimes situations where we're taking transplant production indoors and we have to provide artificial light. If we use the right amount of light, we're going to grow robust uh, transplants. are gonna have thicker stems, better leaf structure, and they will grow better when they're transplanted into the field. If we grow these transplants in areas that don't have enough light, we end up having elongated stems, we end up having thin, weak leaves, and we end up having a lot of problems when we try to move those seedlings to the field. So we wanna be sure that, that, that we have plenty of light on transplants. And if we're, again, if we're, if we're growing outdoors in a, in a structure and the plastic has been on that structure for several years and starting to darken, it's likely time to take that plastic off and replace it with a covering that allows as much light to pass through as we can, as we can get. Now, this picture shows uh, LED lights on a lettuce uh, crop indoors. It is possible certainly to replace natural light with, with artificial light. But if this is your approach, if you're growing indoors, then it's important to understand the quality of light that you have. And there are specialists who focus on, on just this and particularly if you're purchasing something like LED lights or uh, 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 some of the other type of, of lighting systems that are developed for transplant production, talk with the, uh, the sales rep and figure out the right type of lighting for your particular application. Uh, again, there's different types of bulbs that can be used. Fluorescent is sort of the traditional approach, but on large scale, high pressure sodium and metal halide lights are used. And increasingly, we're seeing interest in LED lights. And this particular uh, installation is different colored LEDs and you can manipulate the spectrum of light with LEDs to, to effectively grow different types of crops. Different crops have, have different demands from the standpoint of spectrum. But again, talk with a specialist and decide what the best approach is in, in your situation. The other thing to consider is the duration of light and the length of time you leave the light on, You know, the length of the artificial day that you've created is uh, specific to different types of crops. Some crops want a longer day than, than other crops. And then temperature is another thing to consider as well. And as we talked about earlier with the spinach example, some crops do better when they are, they're germinating and growing under cool conditions. Other crops do better in warm conditions. And this is, is uh, a direct reflection of, of warm and cool season crops. You know, those crops that are cool season crops 
typically germinate better at cool temperatures and you produce better quality seedlings at cooler temperatures. And warm season crops, again, the same thing follows. And this table gives us an idea of, uh, of some of the temperatures that we might consider. And if we pick out, let's look at cucurbits, for example. The optimum germination range from the standpoint of the media is 75 to 95 degrees, and it takes three to six days for these seeds to germinate and emerge. As far as growing them on, a good day temperature is 70 to 80 degrees, and a good night temperature is 60 to 70 degrees. And our transplant uh, growth period is typically four to six weeks from planting the seed to moving the transplant out into the field. And again, there's similar, similar situations for the other vegetables as well. Now let's turn our attention to some of the, the problems that can show up during transplant production. And we'll start talking about, with a discussion of diseases. And there are diseases that can strike the uh, transplants as we're growing them. And we wanna think about how we can manage these problems. And it's best to take an integrated approach rather than just saying, well, I'm going to have to apply a fungicide just as a matter of course. Uh, yes, we, we have to be very cautious with seedlings because they are vulnerable to attack from pests, but we do have non chemical approaches to managing transplant diseases. And sanitation is very important. Uh, I discussed earlier the importance of sanitizing uh, plastic containers, cells, trays, and, and other things that we wanna use from season to season. And by doing that, that can be very helpful in managing diseases. We also wanna think about developing a growing environment that is suitable for the particular crops. So the right temperature, the right relative humidity, the right amount of light, we want to allow adequate spacing among the plants. It's a mistake to take a plant that is going to be larger statured and put it into a small cell and try to grow more plants within that same growing space. Much better to plant in larger cells and allow more air movement or space for those plants to grow. Because good air movement equates to fewer disease issues. Now, if you do choose to use fungicides, again, typically we don't need to use them, only rarely needed, but make sure that you use registered products Make sure that the label allows you to use these fungicides in a protected environment, as is the case when growing, growing uh, seedlings. And again, there's lots of information out there to, to help understand disease management of vegetable transplants in, in the uh, greenhouse. <clears throat> Some more thoughts on sanitation. Always good to use clean or treated seed. You know, I mentioned earlier the idea of a heat treatment for seed. We discussed that in, in the seed and seed treatment video, and it can be very helpful to, to heat treat seed to eliminate any viruses or bacteria that might be present on the seed itself. We also want to make sure that our planting containers are clean. We want to use a medium that is disease-free. Good practice to keep the structure where you're growing seedlings free from weeds. Weeds serve as a harborage for diseases, insects, and other problems. So try to maintain an area that is free from weeds. In some cases, it could be helpful to disinfect structures. You know, that seed starting structure that we saw earlier, it would be a simple matter to spray the inside of that structure with a disinfectant to help take care of any disease um, uh, organisms or structures that might be present on the, the pipes, the plastic, or the benches. If we have infected seedlings, oftentimes the best approach is to discard those immediately before problems spread. And then make sure that you wash your hands when you're working with seedlings and make sure that you wash out for cross-contamination. Sort of the classic story here is, is the, uh, the uh, disease uh, tobacco mosaic virus. And tobacco mosaic virus is actually found in uh, cigarettes, cigars, pipe tobacco, and, and dipping tobacco. And if you're a tobacco user, and then you, you uh, work with crops, particularly crops like tomatoes, it's very easy to, to potentially contaminate your crop with viruses that might be on your hands from smoking cigarettes or using uh, dipping tobacco. So be sure to wash your hands before you work with, with uh, vegetable transplants. Management of the environment is an important way to help manage diseases. Oftentimes the issue is humidity. And if we have excess humidity, it tends to set up environmental conditions that favor diseases. So proper ventilation to manage humidity is very important. We mentioned earlier the importance of watering plants in the morning rather than in the evening. Uh, a good practice is to do your, your main watering in the morning. And then if you do need to do some spot watering in the afternoon, great. But don't water in the evening. Try to have plants transplants going into the evening and night in a dry condition. 
and then maintain steady growth with proper nutrition. Again, good growth conditions lead to healthy plants. Some thoughts on insects. Uh, a number of insects can be problems on transplants. Way at the top are aphids. And this is a picture showing aphids on a tomato transplant. We can also have issues with white flies, thrips, fungus flies, and mites. Now to manage transplant, transplant insect pests, make sure that the medium that you're using is free from insects, particularly from fungus gnats. Uh, it can be helpful to monitor your transplants regularly using sticky cards. Yellow cards are what are traditionally used. There are also other colored cards for other pests, but yellow cards are very helpful in, in uh, uh, monitoring for, for a number of different insect species. Make sure that you clear out, clean, and sanitize the uh, area where you're growing transplants between transplant crops. Remove those weeds. Again, those weeds can also be harborage for insects. So make sure you, you keep a clean area where you're growing your transplants. If you do choose to use insecticides, make sure they're registered products, use them at the right rate, and make sure that, uh, that you follow all the label guidance from the standpoint of the effective use of any sort of insecticide, whether it be organic or conventional. Here's an example of a yellow sticky card. And uh, the, the farmer will hang these near, near the uh, transplants and then check them frequently uh, once a day, looking for evidence of insects that might've got caught on the traps. Yellow is a very attractive color for a number of insects. And these traps are coated with a sticky substance and the insects contact the trap, they get stuck there and they're very easy then to monitor. Okay, the final thing we're gonna talk about today is hardening off. So you've done a great job of, of choosing the right medium, you've chosen good quality seed, you've developed your production system, you've done an excellent job on watering and monitoring the environment and fertilizing as necessary and they're clean from the standpoint of insects and diseases. Well, now it's time to move them to their home. And this is a very important stage. It is possible for transplants to stay too long inside. Here we see some cucumber transplants that were basically left probably two to three weeks too long before they were transplanted out. So it is important to transplant at the proper stage. But we have to recognize that when we move a transplant from a protected environment into the field or the high tunnel, we're moving it into an environment that's often colder or hotter. Frequently it's more windy, it may be wetter or drier than the control conditions where it was growing in the greenhouse. And this can be, this can be difficult, this could be really rough on transplants. So we need to gradually acclimate these transplants to life in the field or in the high tunnel. If we just directly move them out there without this hardening off process, they will be stressed. We'll see slow establishment and we may even see transplant death. And hardening generally takes about seven to 10 days. It's a gradual process. So how do we harden off transplants? Well, first of all, we want to in improve ventilation to remove uh, reduce temperature. And we also want to increase air movement. In other words, we want air moving over and around these transplants. And we can do some of this indoors by opening up vents, but frequently what's done is to load the transplants on racks like we see here, move them outdoors in the morning, move them back in, uh, let them stay, you know, move them out, let them stay for a few hours, and then move them back into the greenhouse before the hottest, windiest part of the day comes. And gradually leave them outdoors for a longer period of time until they're, they're able to spend the entire day outdoors. Um, other things that will help with hardening off are to reduce watering a bit. I mean, you don't wanna stress them. You don't want them to dry out, but you can reduce watering. You can also reduce fertilization. We're going to expose them to full sunlight. You know, By moving them out on racks like this, we're now exposing them to full sunlight. And then mechanical stimulation. So uh, just the, the movement of air, you know, breezes and, and uh, light winds over, over uh, seedlings will help them acclimate. We can actually do some of this ourselves by brushing lightly over the tops of seedlings with a soft brush. And uh, this, this can be helpful. We can also use a gentle uh, uh, air current from a fan or perhaps uh, some sort of handheld uh, air blower to get mechanical stimulation as well. But our goal again is to toughen these plants up to get them ready for life in the outside environment. Here's another example where the uh, transplants are going to be left on that wagon and gradually the plastic covering will be removed to, to allow the uh, transplants to, to, to harden off in anticipation of planting. 
Okay, so this is uh, my final table, and I'm not going to go through this, but there are lots of tables available that can help guide you on things such as the best time to seed, also the optimum germination temperature, and the size container you need to grow a transplant. If we pick something out, let's look at, um, oh, let's look at collards. So collards, we want to plant four to six weeks before we want to take them to the field. The best germination temperature for collards is 65 degrees, and we're typically going to use a 50 or a 72 cell insert for collards. Uh, let's look at something like um, eggplant. Eggplant, we'll start that four to eight weeks before we want to plant it out. Good germination temperature, 70 to 85 degrees, and we're going to use a 50 cell tray. So again, if you're new to the production of transplants, use the uh, information on these tables to help guide you in, in developing good, strong, healthy transplants when it's time to move them out to the field. So uh, these are the same resources that I discussed in uh, the uh, seed and seed treatment video, but they're also good resources to refer to when starting transplants. So take a look at these. There's also a lot of resources available from the standpoint of actually growing the transplants. And I encourage you to check some of those out as well. And that brings us to the close of the workshop. And at this point, if there are any questions, I'd, I'd love to address them. Yeah, and I did uh, figure out a way if anyone would like to ask a question verbally, I think I did figure out a way to allow participants to talk. So that's a, a, an option. Uh, we don't have any pending questions in the Q&A, but this is a very important topic and it's actually something that came up with our farmers today. Um, we're getting, a, as you know, a, a new greenhouse at one of our locations and the staff just mentioned needing a bit more training around transplanting and really how to utilize a greenhouse, which, you know, I know is kind of adjacent to this issue, but uh, overall it's, it's a big topic and I know it can really increase efficiencies on the farm or garden. So there's a lot to know about it for sure. There is indeed. It, it's uh, increasingly farmers are growing their own transplants. And, you know, it can be very costly to go through that trial and error period to figure out how to do it. So again, it's, it's, it's helpful to, to check some of the resources, to check, check this video and to talk to established farmers about the techniques that have worked, you know, for, for them in, in producing seedlings. Again, if anyone would like to, un yeah. if anyone, oh, go ahead, please. Oh, no, I, I just said we, we don't have any questions. So I think uh, you can go ahead and close us out. Okay, well, very good. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, please give us some feedback on the evaluation. Oh, we do have a question that just came in. Oh, perfect. Okay, can you go ahead and read that to me, please? Oh, you might see it and I do not. I think it's in chat, actually. Okay, one second. Maybe it's more of a comment than a question. Let's see what it has. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I've seen several people create a seating chamber with old with an old refrigerator, a crock pot for heat and humidity, and the temperature regulator. The crock perfect. pot was nice. Yeah, absolutely perfect. Uh, repurposing something like an old refrigerator works great. And the refrigerator is insulated, so it does a great job of holding the warmth inside, and it's also sealed, so it does a great job of holding humidity in. So yes, a refrigerator can work quite well as a germination chamber. And then another question from a home gardener starting their own seedlings indoor this year, uh, indoors this year, and wondering how often they should fertilize their transplants. In, in a home garden setting, I usually advise fertilizing once a week. And again, start fertilizing when that first true leaf pops out and, uh, you know, as far as the amount, it's a little harder to, to give a good recommendation in a home setting. But if you're using a dilute fertilizer that has instructions on the container, and you know, you're going to dissolve it in water, uh, just follow the directions on the container. And frequently, there'll be a rate there for, for transplants or something like that. And that's the rate to follow. And once a week should be sufficient for fertilizing your seedlings. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I'm ignorant here. Like, what do you fertilize with? Well, you know, on the organic side, there are fertilizers based on fish emulsion and uh, uh, other types of organic materials that are soluble enough that you can dissolve them in water and then apply them with a sprinkler can or through, a, through an automated system over the plants. Conventional fertilizers are uh, just that. They're conventional fertilizers that are soluble. And they frequently contain 
nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and sometimes other nutrients as well. And they're dissolved in water and then applied to the seedlings. Okay, thank you. Very informative. Do we have any other questions? No, I believe we have got them all answered. Okay, well, very good. Well, it was a pleasure to be with you here this evening. Um, moving ahead, if there's anything that uh, Springfield Community Gardens or I can do to help you in your farming and your gardening, please reach out and, and let us know. Thank you. Have a nice night.